I will introduce them in alphabetical order and, uh, and then we will proceed. We have with us uh, Dr. Maureen Maisha Alma, who is an educator, a gender studies scholar, and an activist. She is, a, she is the professor for childhood indifference, diversity studies at the University for Applied Sciences at Magdeburg uh, Stendhal. She's been there since 2008. She um, is currently a visiting professor at the Center for Interdisciplinary Gender Studies at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, she has been active in the Black Queer Feminist Collective uh, titled Gen uh, Generation Adifra, uh Black Women in Germany since 1993. Uh, her research focuses on diversity, inequality, plurality in textbooks and didactical materials in East and West Germany, uh, intersectional sexual education as empowerment for Black communities and communities of color, critical whiteness, intersectionality, decol decoloniality, and critical race theory. Uh, next, we have Dr. Mabula Sumaru, who is an associate professor in the English department at the University of Francois Rabelais in Tours in France. She's a specialist in the field of Afri Africana studies. She has conducted research and taught in several universities and prisons in the United States and France. From 2013 to 2017, Dr. Sumaru served as a member of the French National Committee for the Memory and History of Slavery. And since 2013, she has been the president of its Black History Month, an organization dedicated to the celebration of Black history and cultures throughout the world. She is the author of Le, Le Triangle et, et Lexagon, Reflexions sur une identité noire, Black is the Journey, Africana, the name, <clears throat> published in this year, in 2020. Last but not least, we have Dr. Benjamin Talton, uh, currently an associate professor of African history at Temple University. Uh, his research, writing, and teaching uh, focus on politics and culture in modern Africa and the African diaspora. His publications include three books, including his most recent, In This Land of Plenty, Mickey Leland in Africa in, in American Politics, uh, which came out last year in 2019. He is currently an editor of, Africans, of the African Studies Review, and he serves on the executive board of the Association for the Study of the World at Worldwide African Diaspora, or ESWAT, and he is a past president of the Ghana Studies Association. So I welcome the panelists and I welcome all of the attendees uh, to uh, our, our discussion of um, Black Lives Matter globally. Um, so what I would like to do at this point is to give each of our panelists an opportunity to uh, give uh, all in attendance a sense of what's happening in their resp respective uh, countries. And we would like to begin with uh, Dr. Uh, Alma. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Gomez. Um, I'm going to start, uh, uh, I've been asked to be brief, so I'm going to try and do this in five minutes. And uh, what I'm going to do is actually uh, draw from two uh, texts, um, two of my current uh, um, articles, one article that I just wrote last month, um, and it's about the twin pandemics of uh, COVID-19 and uh, racism. And uh, it's uh, a second title is Notes from um, summer in Berlin in 2020. And the second article I'm going to draw from is an article that I wrote together with um, a young scholar, Kenyan German scholar, Eric Otieno, and uh, with my colleague, um, also black feminist scholar, Peggy Piescher. And the article is called Reclaiming Our Time in African Studies. So I'm going to start with the first article and I'm going to read a short passage and then just say, I use that to contextualize where we are right now in Germany. So the COVID has forged a substantial global commonality in less than half a year, one which had until now proved elusive. Multiple social movements had tried again and again to initiate this transnational level of shared aims and had consequently the convergence of a highly contagious traveling virus, relentless social media activism, 
the hypervisibility of a global death count, the beginning collapse of populist feel-good political economies, and the breakthrough of the Black Lives Matter movement, activist philosophy, has effectively set the stage and settlement whose trajectory we are yet to witness. What I'm trying to touch on here is um, how um, the situation of dealing with um, a global pandemic has uh, forced us all into a space of shared experience on a in a global sense and has exposed the cracks of democratic institutions and uh, their safeguards and uh, effectively um, brought us into a situation of st stress testing democracy and, and democratic institutions. For Germany, this has played out, um, especially since uh, late May, I think it was May the 26th, when 46-year-old George Floyd uh, was killed in Minneapolis, and we watched a video uh, broadcasted by the 17-year-old Daniela Frazier, and uh, this set off um, a, a wave of, of shock uh, in Germany and resulted in Black Lives Matter protests in over 20 cities, uh, both in East and West Germany. So what we see here is on the side of, of the movement of people of color and of um, people of Germans of African heritage and of people of Afri African heritage in Germany is the recognition. It's a powerful reference and a, and a recognition discourse that is kind of breaking through and having a mainstreaming moment. And I think we're going to talk later with uh, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, with Mabula and with Ben, about the, the pros and cons of mainstreaming. So uh, in actual fact, there have been Black Lives Matter protests in Berlin since 2015. Uh, so about two years after the in initiation of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, by Alicia Gasa and uh, Opal Tometi and um, last name that I'm- Colors. Thank you, Patrice Colors Kam uh, 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 Kulua. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mabula, thank you so much. So, um, this is, uh, um, what has happened in Germany is that we have been working in, in uh, a movement of people of color and people of African heritage, and uh, we have been protesting institutionalized anti-blackness. And uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has been demonized so far. It's been demonized uh, um, in the uh, North American context for quite a while, and it's been demonized in, in Germany as well, uh, with different lenses. I think in the North American context, there was something about it being Marxist, that is not an issue in Germany or in Europe, and in Germany it was more about it being uh, anti-white. And we've been trying to have this debate about being pro-black does not mean being anti-white, it just means pointing out the normalization of institutionalized um, anti-blackness. So that's the one side. And I'm going to end the first part of, 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 my, um, of, of, of my impulse by uh, um, building the bridge across from, from the mainstreaming to um, what we hope it's going to, uh, um, uh, um, it's going to be able to, to um, form, which is an infrastructure, a critical infrastructure. So um, just to, to, to uh, uh, um, finish the point on the mainstreaming of, of um, hashtag Black Lives Matter, um, one of the, the, the um, experiences that we have as a, as a Black feminist, a queer feminist organization, Generation Adefra, we're 30 years old, we have never had the kind of um, donations that we've had since the, the um, publication of, of um, uh, the, the killing of George Floyd. So from all kinds of places that are considered white spaces in Berlin, Reinickendorf, Weissensee, in parts of East Berlin, in, in, in the outer suburbs, people have been sending us donations from five euro to a thousand euro. Uh, people who have micro microbreweries have been sending us their weeks uh, uh, takings and asking us for another uh, um, black and people of color group whom they can send the, the next week's takings to support the work we're doing. And uh, this work being um, uh, trying to strive for the equality, for equal protection, equal safety of people of African heritage. So that's the one, one materialization that we are dealing with. And there's, there's something about empathy in the public discourse that's there. But on the other hand, we also have these huge protests, the Black Lives Matter marches, um, which were attended by millions during the, the, the COVID crisis. So about 4 million at, at one march. And we had white groups or white people who are merchandising Black Lives Matter merchandise and didn't really know much about the movement. But now they're selling t-shirts at high prices. So that's the other part of the equation. So the last thing I want to say in this first round is that 
in the text that we wrote together, Reclaiming Our Time in African Studies, it's a text that's going to be published anytime now. It's in the Critical African Studies Journal, and it's in a special edition that's called Decolonizing African Studies. What we have tried to do in, in the institution, uh, um, in, in um, the field of, of um, uh, teaching and, and research and uh, knowledge production is to strengthen um, uh, the, the knowledge about anti-blackness and about the institu institutionalization of anti-blackness. So Berlin being the scene of uh, 1884, the Berlin so-called Congo Conference, 84, 85. Um, so we've been trying to um, find, build an infrastructure to, to show what kind of knowledge we need to tackle anti-blackness, which is deeply normalized. And I'll go on in, in the next round and, 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 and show what the materializations of, anti, of institutionalized, institutionalized anti-blackness are. Um, in reclaiming our time in African studies, um, we try to link black studies scholarship to African studies scholarship. Black studies scholarship exists in Germany outside of the academy. The black studies movement in Europe has materialized in so far that the UK now has a Black Studies um, um, program uh, with uh, Professor Kehinde Andrews, but that elsewhere we do not have institutions. We work on, on knowledge production uh, about anti-Blackness outside the academy. What we do have in the academy is African studies. And I think in comparison to, to France, uh, Mabula can say more about that. I think we are very um, depoliticized in Germany. Our African studies are, are very unpolitical. And they're very much in the area of, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the realm of area studies. Um, um, scholars of African heritage, we wrote this text to make, uh, uh, as a call of action, to say that we want to repoliticize African studies. And that's the idea of reclamation that's behind it. So we want to uh, um, uh, bring the, the aspect of decoloniality, but we also want to speak about what our position is as scholars of African heritage within African studies which is a situation in which many, many scholars endure harm. I'm going to stop there for now and pass on to my next, the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alma. Professor Sumalu. My turn. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Maureen, for some of the issues you have raised, and I'm sure we can have a fruitful conversation about um, you know, the plight of African studies within French and German academies. Um, so to talk about France right now, um, what we can say since, uh, you know, the public killing of George Floyd uh, by the police in Minneapolis, in Minneapolis um, I think this event, just because it was heavily covered uh, by the, you know, like on social media, but also in mainstream media, gave, um, I mean, was used as an oppor opportunity by a committee fighting for uh, you know, justice in a case of police brutality um, based on the killing of a man of Malian descent by the name of Adama Traoré, who was killed uh, not by the police, but by the gendarme. And the gendarme is the police force of the army. Uh, so um, Adama Traoré was killed in a Parisian suburb back in 2016. And since 2016, there, has been, uh, there have been mobilization, marches, protests, um, asking, demanding justice and a fair trial for the people who were involved in the death of Adama Traoré. So this is how the, um, uh, the committee Justice for Adama was created. And this committee, as I said, has been marching since 2016. What happened in this very specific moment, uh, you know, the, the global pandemic um, um, and the heavy covering uh, at all levels of the George Floyd uh, killing in the United States, and based also on the traditional covering and also observation that France has of the United States. There's a long tradition of uh, you know, media coverage, uh, cultural interest, historical interest, political, economic interest uh, that ties France and the United States since the very you know, early days of the Republic, since, I mean, France was a supporter a logistic supporter in the war for independence as it was fought by uh, you know, the US patriots uh, back in, uh, from 1776 on, right? So there's this long tradition of France um, finding an interest um, in US affairs. What happened um, this time is just because the French media was covering George Floyd, the moment was created for the uh, Justice for Adama Committee to uh, force France to look at cases 
of police brutality that were happening in hexagonal France. And I'm insisting on, the, on, 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 on these characteristic hexagonal France. There have been you know, mobilizations outside of hexagonal France. I'm talking about the overseas departments and territories, Reunion Island, uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Guyana. Uh, so all those, I don't know, former colonies that are no longer colonies, but are still part of the, uh, of, of the French nation um, somehow. Uh, so there, there, there's always a difference between what happens in the hexagon and what happens overseas. Just like there is always a difference between what happens within cities and outside of the cities in the suburb, right? The center and the peripheries, wherever they may be located. So the opportunity of the George Floyd media covering and the general unrest it created in the United States and throughout the world um, helped the um, Justice Adama Committee um, to draw greater attention to what they were uh, you know, fighting for and the demand that they were having towards the justice system, that is to say, a fair trial, and at least an, a serious investigation that would give answers to the family uh, and accounting for the death of, of this young man. Um, so what, happened, what, what followed is that Asa Traoré, uh, who's been organizing since the death of her, fa uh, of her brother, um, organized a march on um, June 2nd in Paris in front of a court of justice and thousands of people came. And that was highly unexpected by uh, the, let's say, the institutions, uh, uh, mainstream, uh, you know, politicians. And so, so there was a lot of media coverage of this march. There was an, a second march, uh, march organized in, uh, in, in Paris somewhere on the 13th of June. And again, thousands of people, dozens of thousands of people gathered, not only in Paris, but also in the rest of France. And this was um, in solidarity with the, 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 the issue of police brutality in the United States, but it was also in solidarity with all the victims of police brutality in France. So because those great mobilizations, because so many people were involved, the media, the institutions, uh, political debates, had to wonder publicly, had to incorporate in the public discourse the issue of police brutality that is tightly connected to the issue of you know, racialization and racism in France. Racialization and racism have been taboo questions in France. They have been taboo questions in French history, um, only in hexagonal France, because we know that because France was an empire, because France held uh, you know, colonies, we know that what you know the the, the 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 connection, the logical connection between imperialism, colonialism, uh, you know, ra racialization, and racism. But I think that because of this dichotomy between the hexagon and the overseas departments, whether we're talking about today or you know the the, the colonies of the past, made it possible in the national psyche to um, let's say stay away or to shun the racial question. Now this is no longer possible, but I'm not saying that this is a new question in hexagonal France even, because we could go back to you know, the post-war immigration um, when uh, people from the former colonies or for, for, from the, the, the departments that are still part of the, of the French nation, people who migrated to hexagonal France, and we know that from the 60s on, there, have been a there has been a series of racial crimes, for instance, or cases of police brutality. But even in that moment, we're still talking about either the you know, colonial moment, even located within hexagonal France, or the recently post-colonial moment. And when we're talking about the racist crimes or the, the, the you know, police brutality cases of the 60s and the 70s, we're talking about immigrants or people who are not French nationals. The, the shift uh, that um, has occurred since the 1970s and really early 1980s is that there, have been, there has been a continue, continuation of you know, police brutality, uh, race, uh, you know, hate crimes and, and racist crimes. But now the people who are mobilizing are not mobilizing, let's say, um, in, in, um, you know, exp to express their demand of you know, justice even for colonial subjects 
or justice for um, in the treatment of their the territory they belong to they are talking from within they are talking as french citizens so what we are really talking about now is um, the meaning of this perhaps more recent french citizenship and french citizenship that has been racialized when the fifth republic just like other republics um, i mean the fifth republic is the fifth constitution and this is the constitution we find ourselves under uh, currently in France since 1958, the Fifth Republic declares itself, you know, colorblind and doesn't pay any att attention to, you know, race, uh, religion, um, what can I say, sex, it's not even gender, it says sex. Um, yes, so it's impossible to have serious public conversations about race because race is not supposed to exist and race is not a let's say a useful or relevant tool of, analy um, of analysis for, you know, in French sociology, in French history. The mobilizations of June 2020 have completely shattered uh, that. Uh, Assa Traoré is a face, Assa Traoré is of Malian origin, Assa Traoré is, uh, you know, a black woman. She has become the face of, uh, you know, the movement that has um, declared its solidarity with Black Lives Matter in the US. And just like uh, Dr. Oma said, um, Black Lives Matter's committees uh, have been in operation in France as well since 2015, right? Regular, uh, you know, let's say organization committees, but also student committees that have also expressed their solidarity with Black Lives Matter uh, as it was founded in the US, but as in, um, let's say, an echo to local matters, whether we are talking about Germany or mm -hmm. France. We are respecting and we are looking and we are supporting Black Lives Matter in the States, but we also want to use, you know, globally Black Lives Matter to remind our particular, our respective nations that racism exists in Europe and other places too. So uh, uh, the point I was, I, I was making here is that uh, because Assa Traoré has become the face of this you know, mobilization, French mobilization that ties issues of police brutality and issues of race and racism, issues of citizenship, citizenship on equal footing, on the basis of equality. Uh, it's also, it's, um, it's, it, it has come as a surprise for France. It, people were basically thinking, I mean, the, I'm talking the main, about the mainstream. What is going on? What is going on? And the first accusation was that it's, it was impossible for uh, the committee justice for Adama to import U.S. matters. You cannot import U.S. matters. You cannot import uh, cases of uh, police brutality. You cannot import, you know, like the racism as it exists because France has no problem recognizing the existence and the operation of racism in the United States, but keeps saying France is not the United States, which is absolutely true. But France, just like the United States, is a racist country, just like many countries are fundamentally uh, racist. So the first accusation um, took that form. It is impossible to uh, make a comparison between France and the United States, even though, as I said in the beginning, France has always compared itself or France has always kept an eye on the United States. So why is it um, a problematic for a committee, for an organization to say, you know, um, racism exists um, in the United States, police brutality as well, racism exists in France, um, just like it exists in the United States and cases of police brutality uh, exist in France too. So why is it problematic in 2020 when we know that since 1782, John de Crèvecoeur, for instance, was, uh, was writing about the, you know, um, uh, the only recent uh, U.S. Republic. We know that Alexis de Tocqueville in 1830 was looking at the United States, was talking about the problem of uh, slavery for the United States. We know that uh, in the 20th century, many presidents, uh, future presidents of France, have benefited from programs that come from the U.S. Embassy and who take French people on an American tour so that it can promote uh, the um, you know, the lifestyle, the politics, and the social organization of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the United States. So the reason why I'm stating and, and give, sharing all those examples is that there has been this constant attention paid to the United States on the part of France, and then on 2020, on the question of race, racism, police brutality, it has become um, impossible to do. 
So this claim has been rejected and this claim is no longer, this position can no longer be uh, you know, maintained because so many people marched and so many people were on the street, uh, people of, of, of different colors, people of different racial identities, took out the streets to uh, express their support in uh, the claim for, um, the claim made by uh, the committee justice for Adama Traoré. So what it has triggered since then is a series of conversation about race, racism uh, in all its forms. Islamophobia, for instance, is uh, uh, one of the latest expressions of the, uh, of the French citizen, um, the French uh, um, racism. All that in the context of the trial of the Charlie Hebdo attacks, the terrorist uh, attacks of uh, 2015, the trial uh, for these attacks just opened, uh, I think, one or two weeks ago, and is going to be on for 49 days. So we are really at a moment of high tensions, of uh, you know, like heated debates around what it means to be a French citizen. You're supposed to be a French citizen if you were a supporter of Charlie Hebdo, if you cried and if you marched for Charlie Hebdo, and you are deemed a non-citizen or an unwilling, ungrateful citizen if you march for Adama Traoré, on the steps, uh, following the steps of the Committee and Justice uh, Committee for Justice for Adama, which is only the latest expression of mobilization around issues of police brutality and racism. Asa Traoré stands on the shoulder of the people who have, I don't know, existed since 1983, and the first major march against, um, well, it was against racism, racism and for justice, and that was 1983, a march that uh, left from Marseille, the south of France. To, um, to reach Paris. So since then, there have been a lot of uh, issues uh, discussed. Uh, illegal aliens, what was called double sentencing, people of foreign origins who once they were found guilty of a crime, of a felony, they were arrested and serving a sentence in, in French prisons. And after serving their sentences, they were uh, sent back to, to their country of origin that sometimes they didn't know. So this is what I want to say. Um, this is uh, maybe the general overview of, of the, the moment. Thank you, Professor Sumaru. Dr. Talton. Thank you, Professor Gomez. And um, thank you, CISA, for inviting me to be part of this. And uh, thank you to my colleagues, Maisha Uma and Mabula Sumahoro. And always nice to be on anything with Mabula, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to learn a lot. I'm always inspired. I look forward to working more with with Maisha, I'm just thinking about the remarks that have been made about these connections and these stances of solidarity that we see, um, points of intersection with, centered around Black Lives Matter, but Black, Black, Black Lives Matter in many ways is just a catch-all, right, for uh, state violence and police, specifically police violence, violence against Black bodies, disregard for, for Black lives. And I, 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 it might be a matter of the decentralized nature of of the movement here in the States, of this non-hierarchical structure here in the States, but I'm not seeing the same sort of intersection coming from this side. If you pay close attention, we'll know about Adama Traore, but we don't, he's not held up. His movement, the response to his killing is not held up in the same way that killings here in the States are. And this idea that color lives matter, which is perking up in South Africa, which is a very different sort of a, a, a non-white lives matter movement and just police violence in different spots around the world. I'm not seeing that here in the States the same way. And that's part of that, I believe, again, is the structure of the movement, decentralized nature of it, but also this, this tendency to center the United States in all things in America, right? It's this, it's this, uh, we, this inward looking nature of Americanness. But it wasn't always that way. And I'm, again, just listening to what, what my colleagues have said and just thinking back to when they say Black Lives Matter is not your grandfather's protest movement, but I think we need a little bit of that grandfather protest movement in there, or grandmother's even more so movement in there. Because think about the 50s and 60s with, and into the 70s, with Mary McCabe coming over here, connecting the movement against apartheid with the civil rights movement here and the Black Power movement here, Stokely Carmichael, again, tied to Mary McCabe, making those connections. Albert Latuli from South Africa and Martin Luther King working together. People don't know how much King paid attention to what was going on in Africa, particularly South Africa. Uh, Tom and Boyle coming over here several times before he even entered the government of Jomo Kenyatta, making those connections between the liberation struggle here 
and the struggle against white minority rule in Southern Africa. So I, we, we're doing this U.S. centeredness now, but that has not been our history. So I, one thing I aspire toward is, is a, a greater engagement with the world from the U.S. and the ways that I hear from what you are presenting this morning or this afternoon for you all uh, coming out of Europe and coming out of Africa. But let me just briefly give a sense of the lay of the land as I see it from the U.S. And I'm sitting in Brooklyn recognizing that Brooklyn, New York is, is the U.S. but doesn't represent the U.S. But I'll try to tap into some of the things going on. The central point I want to make is that what we've proven since the, the, the tragic killing of George Floyd, even going back to 2014, is that movements matter, protests matter. It, may, it does make a difference. People would say, okay, what, what are you accomplishing with that? But to my eyes, it, it's, it's made a difference. And we see there, there are ongoing, the protests are ongoing. Portland is still going on. Louisville is still going on, Minneapolis, Kenosha, they're still active. And I'm, I'm glancing at my phone because I know today, at some point I'm refreshing, refreshing because the grand jury verdict for Breonna Taylor is coming out today. And so I, I just got a text, it's, it's at 1.30, so I could stop looking at my phone. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But we see the ways in which they know protests matter. Or the state, these cities know that protests matter as symbols, as, 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 as transformative agents, because the ways in which they show force against that, right? The militarization of police responses to nonviolent protests demonstrate that they matter, the theatrics of power show that it matters, sending the, sending the signal that these protests are dangerous, sending the signal that these protests are bad, sending the signal that police lives are in danger from these protests. And they're, and they're, they're arming up in, in Louisville right now in anticipation of protests in response to the verdict from this grand jury around Breonna Taylor. So this, this, and they know the, the, the cameras are rolling. So it's, it's theater in the face of nonviolent, in face of nonviolent violent protests. So that sends the signal that, that protests matter. But just here in New York, which is, which is very different from Louisville and Portland and, and Kenosha, uh, the protests are continuing as I see them. We see, uh, they're, but they're, they're smaller in scale, uh, largely white. They are, we have uh, joggers for justice and bikers for justice, They'll, they will pop up. What's fascinating though, and this is what's very different from 2014, 2016, in windows, even in gentrified neighborhoods, we see Black Lives Matter. Murals that's, that say Black Lives Matter. The, the streets painted with yellow letters, Black Lives Matter. And this is, um, this is a new phenomenon. This is just, just since George Floyd. So we see the protest matter in, this, in the way that they're changing the narrative around police violence. But at the same time here in New York, we have a police department that is majority non-white, or at least approaching majority non-white. But there's this police union head by Pat Lynch, who's endorsed Donald Trump, who is fueling this narrative of anarchy in the streets of New York City, which there are not, which it is not, but just supporting this Trump narrative of, of chaos in the streets and that blue lives matter and that uh, the police are under threat, and that BLM is a terrorist organization. And I believe coming from him, uh, not necessarily mandating, or, but suggesting, encouraging that police officers don't wear masks. And to me, that is so, so telling. In a city where masks are normal, in the protests, we're, we're, we're wearing masks. In coffee shops, we're, we're wearing masks. Walking down the streets, you pull your mask up when, you, when people pass you. But the police officers are not wearing masks, even as they're patrolling these nonviolent protests. They're unmasked, putting our lives in danger, I believe, but also sending the signal that they're different from us. They're apart from us. They're exceptional from us. So I think that's telling. That's telling. And we also see that just moving beyond New York, these protests matter with this grand jury meeting. We protests matter with the 12 million uh, plus settlement that Breonna Taylor's estate has received. I don't believe that would have been the case without these protests. And also just the conversation around remaking public safety, reimagining public safety. Uh, we could call it defunding the police, which we can have a conversation about maybe later ago, uh, a, little, a little later on. But I don't think two months ago, 
we would have been discussing defund the police in the United States of America. Uh, I think it, it, it was a non-starter. We also have this powerful response from athletes. Now there's this long tradition of African-American athletes uh, responding to injustice in the United States. But here they're really using their social media platform, uh, uh, boycotting tennis matches, boycotting games. And in response, again, the power of protests, getting these NBA owners to open up the arenas for, for voting, which is fantastic. Because as we know, voting in the United States is a big challenge. And also we see the basketball players with Black Lives Matters on their jerseys and I can't breathe and making these statements, say her name, Breonna Taylor. It's, this is protest and it's a, it's a powerful moment. Again, the powerful moment, the power, the power of protests here in New York with the repeal of uh, 50A, which is this, this, this law that says that we don't reveal police records of misconduct of any nature, which is shocking. These are public servants, public employees, paid for by uh, New York State tax funds. And we can't see when they have misbehaved. We can't see how, how well they're performing in the job that we are paying for. It's just shocking. Again, this distance between the police and the citizens. So we have this, we have the repeal of that. But now Pat Lynch has sued to to uh, put that on hold. So we'll see what happens with that. But also here in New York City, again, the power of protest, we ban chokeholds. And that's even, the fact that that's even a debate, I find, I find shocking. Uh, so again, uh, looking nationally, and I'll close with this and we could have a conversation and we could speak about uh, some of the other things going on in curriculum and anti-racism. But in the White House, we have Attorney Bill Barr, who is baiting violence, essentially, and saying that those who engage in violence or vandalism in these protests will receive enhanced penalties. Again, that's the false narrative that those people, the majority of those who are protesting are engaged in violence and, and, and looting and vandalism. We know that a lot of that is the infiltrators. So we also know that 95% of these protests have been completely completely nonviolent, right? And it's their constitutional right to, to protest. So what we're doing is we're foreclosing on citizens of the United States engaging in their constitutional right to protest. And he's saying that, well, there's this, there's this, uh, this uh, inherent violence to the state and to police uh, uh, with these protests signaling that they are necessarily bad and, and um, that police are at threat. It's this chilling, chilling uh, 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 foreclose on people exercising their constitutional rights, which is, which is terrifying, which is terrifying. So it also speaks to the fact that we must get out and vote in November and change this administration. So I wanna have some conversation around anti-racism and some things we're doing with the curriculum. Uh, I wanna go back to this conversation of the politics of, of African studies. Uh, African studies in the United States claims to be non-political, which is a political statement and the difference between black studies and African studies in this country. But I wanna stop because I don't wanna take up too much time because I wanna engage in this conversation. Thank you, Professor Carlton. I mean, this is, these are all fascinating and important points that each of you have made. And I have some questions for each of you, but I think that um, I, it may be more beneficial and more generative for, to, to allow uh, space for you to engage each other I can I can step in step in if needed, but I'm perfectly happy to be quiet. I want to return then to uh, Professor Alma and give her an opportunity to um, <clears throat> provide us with reflections on what has been said, as well as you know further reflections on what's happening in Germany and if she wishes uh, elsewhere in Europe. All right. Um, thank you again, um, Professor Gomez on, and uh, my colleagues again. I'm going to be informal and just say Mabula and Ben. Um, my, my head is buzzing on what I, I want to touch on um, uh, with, with uh, all of you. So um, I'd like to add uh, um, uh, one thing to what I presented and then come to my questions that I have for Ben and Mabula. Um, the surprising thing that's going on in Germany right now. Uh, with, 
the, the surprising thing happening right now, in, or, or what has surprised me in, in these crazy times when nothing surprises me, is the um, protests, the conservative protests, where they tried to breach um, the parliament in Berlin the other day, the Reichstag. You probably saw those pictures. There's also been memes and, and spin-offs that I'm not going to go into. But Twitter, it's, it's obviously something that material for Twitter. So these conservative protests are extremely surprising on, on the one hand, because um, the issue of, of democracy and of democratic institutions in Germany has been very much within the narrative of enlightenment and um, rationality. And this was always symbolically bound with white men um, who, who then are the most rational and then the rest of us. So it's, it's interesting to see how this materialization is challenging that notion and, and making us look towards no, new concepts of civic education. So to break it down a little bit more and to connect it, especially now to what uh, you were touching on, Ben, at least that's, that's, that's how I read the, the current situation on, on the mobiliz mobilization to vote, is that actually the, the problematic groups who, who have little respect for democratic institutions are actually white men mm -hmm. in the age between 18 to 45. So this is the group that we're saying that votes against equality and that is not, not uh, willing uh, to uh, wear masks and, and to, to uh, protect each other. So this, this is interesting. And the interesting part is also that the mobilization or the, the groups, at least from what I'm seeing in the United States, is mostly black women who are like the, the fortress of de democratic institutions and, and therefore of rationality. And, and I'm going to use rationality loosely because the conception was actually flawed from the beginning. But if you're talking about anything that we say we, we, want, we, we hold people accountable and, and uh, uh, we want to put people in charge who actually care about more than themselves and care about preventing death, then, then it's actually mostly um, that there's a gender dimension and there's a dimension of people who are, who are um, racially marginalized, especially black women. So that's, that's one thing that's, that's been surprising to me in Germany that we're at the point where we're saying the problematic group is actually white men. It's interesting to, to, to uh, arrive at this point because civic education always targeted people who are outside of whiteness. And now we're at this point. And then, um, now to come to my questions, uh, Mabula, you, had, you, you talked about the whole question of, of, of the taboo of speaking about race and racism in France. That has been my experience from an inter-European perspective, that every time we, we start talking about race with people who, who come from the context of uh, hexagonal France, then uh, um, there's, there's this whole thing about, no, there's no race, it's all class. And we know there's race. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting inflection point to be at the point where uh, we begin to negotiate, how do we talk about um, racial marginalization and institutionalized uh, anti-blackness? How do we talk about, and this is the thing about the, the COVID crisis, how do we talk about institutionalized negligence? Who is dying? In France, from what I hear, it's, it's specific regions, uh, inner city regions, and Berlin is the same thing. So what we're doing in Berlin right now, and Professor Gomez had touched on this right at the, the top of, of our session, how do we um, gather equality data? So Germany has, has this huge panic about gathering equality data because they use it for um, eugenic purposes to exterminate people. So uh, it's, we are right to be uncomfortable about, about gathering data. But we are at an inflection point where Berlin is beginning to collect equality data. And this equality data is beginning to look at, are you racially marginalized? So at the moment, we are, we are speaking of one of the largest um, 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 studies called the Afro Census has been uh, 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 put into effect. I took part in this study, obviously, as a participant. And it's from our anti-discrimination, our, our federal anti-discrimination board that is now trying to, to make fast steps and look at what is the situation of, of uh, um, Germans of African heritage or people of African heritage in Germany and uh, uh, across different areas. And uh, uh, with the COVID crisis, there's going to be disaggregated data that looks at where do people of African heritage mostly live? We are forced to live in these areas. In what kind of jobs do we work? Because we are forced to work in these jobs mm -hmm. where many of us are, are essential workers. Many of us cannot work from home offices. This data is, is being gathered in reports within the, the context of the um, 
um, UN decade for people of African heritage. We are at the midpoint of this UN decade. It began in 2015. It goes on until 2020. This is where we are right now. And I would, I would support Majin, uh, 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 Mabula's thesis, uh, uh, thesis at that point where you said it's possible to have these conversations which was so taboo. We've been able to speak, speak about race, but we have not been able to speak about equality data. And we're at the point where we can speak about equality data and it has been sped up. It's been mobilized by the situation with the, with the COVID crisis because we can see that people in, in areas of, of uh, smog and, and uh, um, poor air, uh, air conditions, um, where mostly racially, racially marginalized people are living, those are the areas where, where your rate of infection is very high and then the rate of your, your illness being very severe is also very high. And um, uh, also mirroring uh, uh, France, um, um, my questions are very associative. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave you the work of, of finding my questions within my, my ruminations. Um, we are at the point in Germany where, where we are debating on the, on the uh, uh, national stage about um, um, eliminating the, the category race from the, from the constitution. Our constitution is called the Grundgesetz. This is article three of our, of our constitution. And this, and this article says all people are equal and no one should, be, um, uh, should have pre preferential treatment or detrimental treatment according to, because of, and then they, they, they say gender, uh, uh, disability status um, uh, and race because of their race. And then uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, uh, this is where, the, where conservatism and, and um, um, uh, politics on the left come together without wanting to, to get into a merger. Very conservative people are saying, cross race out of it, then we never have to speak about race again. And people who are very much on the left are saying all, all people are created equal and saying that, that race, someone has a race, means that we actually believe in, 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 in something that, that is not substantial. Uh, uh, theoretically. So we are, we are in this wrestling process of, of trying to say we wanted to, to still say racist discrimination. And then we also, we also want to read further and say it also says do not privilege anyone. People only really to say do not disadvantage anyone, but it says do not privilege anyone. And we're arguing that in homogeneous uh, uh, areas, stratas of society, people, these spaces are homogeneous because people have been privileged because of being a white male, for example. Uh, coming from from uh, a certain social class, so that's where we are right now. And and after opening up these points, I'd like I'd be very interested to hear mm -hmm. what Mabula and Ben think about any of that. Mm -hmm. Professor Alma, thank you so much um, <clears throat> for uh, your observations and questions. Before we turn to the other two panelists, uh, beginning with Professor Sumaru, um, what we want we 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 want to be conscious of the time, and so I want the panelists to you know, uh, kind of truncate their responses if they can, uh, because we're running up against uh, um, the clock. And also for the participants, for all the participants, uh, if you have questions, please write your questions and send them to the Q&A box. And we will attempt to try to answer at least a few of them. All right, Professor Sumaru. So thank you very much, uh, Maureen, for, for your questions, because I deeply appreciate the connections you can make about this European approach, not American, and, and, and I'm, I'm saying American, like continental, not only US, this American approach and this European approach. And France and Germany have history in common, a history of war, but also a history of collaboration. So of course, Germany, uh, it was in charge of Nazism, but France was the sidekick. So there's also this legacy of shame, this legacy of collecting racial or ethnic or religious, uh, religious data uh, that, were, uh, that was um, you know, designed to, uh, for genocide, right? Uh, you know, um, the, the Shoah, the Jewish people, but also Roma populations that we, we tend to forget, right? So now there's this um, negotiation of this shame in the post-war moments that we still live in. And, and we have exactly the same issues about you know, the impossibility uh, to talk about race and the impossib uh, impossibility to collect racial or ethnic data. So what we do is use all types of strategies to avoid talking directly about race, 
and still handle, manage, and produce race and racism, you know, constantly. This is what we do. So you, uh, one of your, your remarks made me, uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, correct myself. When I said that um, France is uh, colorblind, because France does not pay, you know, like constitutionally, any attention to race. But uh, in 2018, the word race was erased from the, competi uh, from the constitution. So be careful, Germany, it's coming, right? Race was not only uh, stripped from the, com the constitution, but interestingly, it was replaced by sex, which makes a very interesting point to me because it has to be one or the other. We'll talk or not talk about race. We'll talk or not talk about gender. We'll talk about r class and not race, right? What we're doing in, 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 um, in storing those impossibilities, those dichotomies, is that we are refusing intersectionality. Interse intersectionality, not as, I don't know, a demand, not as a, I don't know, a goal, what people tend to forget, especially now that intersectionality and Crenshaw's works have been translated in, in, in France and perhaps more circulating in, in, in Europe and perhaps in, in Germany as well, is that people tend to react to intersectionality as if it was an objective. Intersectionality is a tool of analysis and it, it is a tool of analysis that leaves room for complexity. And I think that one of the parts of racism that we sometimes not, dis, you know, not discuss en enough is the erasure and is the oversimplification, right? So we don't have to choose between race and class. We don't have to choose between race and gender. We don't have to choose between, uh, I don't know, uh, heterosexuality or homosexuality or you know, heteronormativity or uh, patriarchy. It can be all of that at the same time. And I think that the biggest and the um, hardest struggle at the moment is really the, um, for people to accept the complexity of individual lives, of individual experiences, of community lives and experiences, right? You can be black and Muslim. You can be Muslim and homosexual. You can be, I don't know, white and poor. We agree on that, right? And we are ready to tackle all these issues simultaneously, otherwise, it's gonna be like it's often been throughout history. First, uh, we're going to talk about you know, class and then we'll talk about the women and the women are gonna be white women. If you're, if you're talking about black women, then you're talking about black people, but black people are men only, right? We all remember, you know, all the women are white, all the blacks are men, but uh, some of us are brave. That's the, you know, the famous uh, black um, feminist anthology. So what, the, the problem is that the, 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 the issue with tackling, managing the complexity of the experience, um, of the experiences. But what the, 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 the global pandemic has made impossible is precisely to shun this complexity. Because of course we know who is dying. We know that the poor are dying. And we know that um, the, 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 the populations of color are more likely to be poor. That's just the structural uh, organization of, of, of the system in our societies. So yes, people in France as well have called for you know, racial or ethnic statistics, even though racial and ethnic statistics had been demanded by organization for a long time. But now, I think, I think that the, um, perhaps the only good news about this uh, you know, COVID-19 moment is, is the impossibility to hide um, how the societies, how the, the structure of our societies operate. This is the only thing that, 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 that is uh, positive about the moment. It makes bare, it unveils all the, um, the structural inequalities and the structural inequalities are inherently um, intersectional. And this is what people will have to, to deal with, right? And, and perhaps one word for, for you, Ben, I was interested in your you know, reminder of the, at times throughout history, more diasporic solidarity, right? And the, 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 the ability sometimes for people based in the US to be less centered on the US and to be in conversation with other parts of the world. So my, my question for you would only be, what do you make of, um, even among the founders of Black Lives Matter, but, uh, but even among the members of Black Lives Matter, uh, um, Black Lives Matter, 
are people of African descent. I'm talking about recent mm -hmm. immigrants. Sometimes mm -hmm. you, 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 you hear the names or you see the names and you know, mm -hmm. you can tell that this person, for instance, might be, I might be wrong, but might be uh, a first generation American. Does it matter? Mm -hmm. Or does it nuance what you just said? Is, is, is it, um, does it leave things as US centric as, uh, uh, as, you, um, as you think? Or does it leave room for, you, you know, I don't know, something yeah. else. Some of the people yeah. who are involved in the moment right now are people of, uh, you know, Caribbean descent, but, but, but I really have in mind the, 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 the people of African descent, all those, sure. those new Africans, the, the ones who might be the equivalent to my generation in France, yeah. people who, um, whose parents came, were immigrants and who were born on U.S. soil and who sure. get, sure. who sure. understand that first they can, perhaps unlike previous generations, they cannot dissociate themselves from the, let's say, uh, traditional African-American uh, experience. It's not gonna, your nationality is not gonna, is not gonna save you. But, but, but even before, I'm thinking about the, the case of Amadou Diallo back in the mid 90s in, um, you know, in New York, the mother of Amadou Diallo who was killed by the mm. police, let's say sided with African Americans when she right. arrived in, in the US. So is there hope? That's my question. Is well, I, I'm, I think there's a I think there's a lot of hope. I'm very optimistic about the diasporic nature of the African American community. It, it's, it's long been mm -hmm. diasporic, but I think I think you spoke part of the answer in in your question, and that the African American community has, is largely a sponge, where your immigrant status, your Africanness, or your Caribbeanness, is largely you know there are some exceptions. Children can be children accepted within the African community as black, mm -hmm. as long as you claim that blackness. Mm -hmm. And so many of the activists I see, you're right, many of them, you see that the name, okay, they or their parents come from the continent or uh, Caribbean is a little harder to, to, to capture. And here in New York, the assumption is, is that you're probably, parents are probably from the, the Caribbean. But I, I think it's that you're, that's not the issue here. And so it still becomes the U.S. because your Africanness is not, is not under attack. It's the Blackness that's under attack within this American context. So I think that's, there is that positive, but you're right. Many of the people at the forefront have been, have, are of either immigrants or children of immigrants, which is, which is beautiful. But I think that's, that's part of the African American experience. I also want to point to another positive very, very quickly. I love this idea of women as the fortress of democratic institutions. Maisha, that's, that's fantastic. Not that it's, it's, it's something I haven't thought about, but to phrase it in that way, I think we need to repeat it because it, has, has, it is that way and has long been that way. Um, very important and accepting the complexity. I want to ask you all, what we have here in the United States that I, su I suggest is different than in Europe. And you can push back. What, race has, a, has, has been at the center of these conversations recently, in part because we have independent Black institutions here in ways that you all don't in Europe. So even if white media establishments aren't discussing it, even if government institutions aren't discussing it, we have HBCUs, we have civil rights organizations, longstanding civil rights law firms, uh, activist organizations that are longstanding. We have our churches that are discussing these issues. And we have a robust community of black journalists that have been writing about these, right? So, so a positive I see, not a wind change, but a change, is that even now, this idea of systemic racism, you all are saying that in Europe, they're not really acknowledging race as an issue, but we have a presidential candidate, Joe Biden, who, is, who accepts that systematic, systemic racism. I'm not sure if he knows exactly what it means, but he's at least saying the words, systemic racism is an issue. And in my administration, we will begin to address it. We have Kamala Harris, who I know has understanding of what systemic racism is. Right? We have op-eds in the newspapers now. So I think we have these institutions that are able to fuel a conversation in ways and center race and the history of racism and systemic racism here in the US that I suspect is just not in existence in that way in Europe. Right. Another point I want to make, just turning back to the, to the United States, since 1619, the great fear of white men in particular, but the white power establishment in general, is coalition between white people and black people. And that is what we're seeing in this moment. And it's, I think it's terrifying, which is why we're having this backlash, which is why 
the, 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 the cult of Trump is responding the way that it's responding. The last thing they want, since 1619, the last thing they've wanted is for white folks and black folks in this country to come together around issues of marginalization, social justice, and oppression. And we're seeing this now. And yes, we have intersectionality is at work here because we have all these issues being brought in. I think, and I think that's fueling this large umbrella that's, 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 uh, that's unfolding under this movement with these different issues. But of course, Black Lives is at the center of it. So I think it's encouraging, but I, again, the lack of a strong and forceful leadership, I see the benefits of a decentralized movement, but the lack of a strong, forceful leadership that's really articulating these issues clearly, drawing these connections, saying this is our agenda, responding to this back backlash is a weakness. But the, intersection, the intersectional nature of the movement, the multiracial, multicultural, multisexual nature of the movement, multigender, is a po powerful, positive force and a sign that change is possible. Uh, and it's encouraging. So again, I think that we benefit from these institutions in ways that uh, our European counterparts just do not. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Talton, and uh, the, 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 the exchange becomes even more intense and more interesting. Uh, we, we are fighting uh, a temporal foe at this moment, and uh, so we only have a couple of minutes. We are, we're already beyond time, uh, but we're going to actually, we're going to come to a hard stop in another 12, 13 minutes. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, what I would like to do, because I have questions too, but it doesn't look like I'm gonna be able to get to them. I do want to allow the, the, uh, those who are in attendance to participate. So what I would like to do is um, put out a couple of questions. One is specifically to Dr. Alma, and then another is for all panelists, but I think it was more or less um, uh, inspired by uh, Professor Talton's remarks. And there's, so let's do this, let's do this. Uh, there are three questions that I think would be um, uh, critical to respond to. And so I'm gonna put the first question to Dr. Alma, the second question to uh, Professor Maru, and then the final question to Professor Talton. And let's do that. And I, I would ask you to be, to exercise some brevity uh, in your response. So there's a question to Dr. Alma, and the question is, what's the connection between anti-Blackness, anti-Turkish xenophobia, and the resurgence of Nazism? Mm. All right. Um, then uh, for Professor Sumaru, uh, because race discussions are made visible, are made invisible by discussions of class in Europe, do you think that Marx becomes a barrier in addressing issues of race in hexagonal France with the traditional emphasis on class? Do you see Marx being used in a conservative way to make race invisible this is a multiple question. Mm. Do, you, do you have that thus far, uh, Professor Sumaru? And she's supposed to be brief? And she's supposed, yes, um, all of you have to, are supposed to be brief. And the final uh, part of this question is, have leftists, have leftist movements moved away from Marx because of this? Okay, and for, for Professor Talton, the question is, considering the solidarity reference, and the earlier mention of Tom and Boya and his work with uh, Dr. King, how can greater alliances be fostered with the Congressional Black Caucus in the US and the few legislators of African descent in France and Germany like Karamba Jabi? We need more of these alliances reaching around the world to support and highlight each other. Others are doing it and are better off politically from those alliances, it's crucial. All right. So I think that's all we'll be able to entertain, Professor, Professor Alma. Okay, thank you again. I'm going to try and, and keep it really brief. I'm glad to hear Kar Karamba Diaby's name being mentioned because he's uh, one of our very few um, um, 
parliament uh, uh, members on the federal stage of African heritage. So to my question, my question was about the connections between anti-blackness, um, uh, anti-Muslim racism is what we call it, um, and uh, uh, racism against uh, other racially marginalized groups, I'm, I'm guessing Sinti and Roma, that's, that's what, what our coalition in, in Germany is. So I'm going to use two um, uh, pointers. One, I put the, the, the address of the, um, um, uh, the URL, the link to, to the text that I spoke about in the chat. And if you read that text, you're going to see uh, what I speak about, about institutionalized negligence, about how hate crimes and also um, far right or racist murders against the groups that have been named. Because the last incident was in February in a shisha bar in Hanau where nine folks were killed. Three of them were, were Sinti and Roma. Um, I think three of them were Kurdish. Another number was people of color. And in this being targeted as people whose lives are disposable and, and who are then made uh, um, the, the, the reference for um, why, why uh, white, white centric um, power is, being, um, is, is, is now being shifted it's those are the bodies that are being made um, um, the target. And, and that's why um, um, we connect anti-Blackness anti to, um, to uh, um, anti-Muslim uh, uh, racism and also to racism against Sinti and Roma. So that would be one reference. And the last reference would be, there's a, a very, there's a text from Yasmin Yildiz. It's called No Address in Germany. And Yasmin Yildiz is um, in the States. She's, she's a professor in the States. Um, she's um, um, a Turkish German. We call it hyphen German, other Germans, whatever. So it's Germans of color. And what she actually, how I, I interpret her work, because uh, um, I use her work to analyze children's literature and to analyze how demonization of, of racially marginalized groups is normalized already in the, in the stages of childhood. How do we start, start uh, marginalizing Sinti and Roma as criminals in, in it blightens uh, children's literature and in other children's literature. So what I'm doing is, is that uh, using Yasmin Yildiz's work, she says there's, we have no address in Germany. All of us were racially marked. We have no address because the person who's always being addressed is the white centric person. So we are all citizens, but only white centric, uh, only white citizens are being addressed and they're being taught about us. So in, in children's literature, what we're seeing is that white children are, are normalized at a very early age. They're, ta they're taught about the inferiority, the barbaricness, the, the criminal, criminalness and the pathology of, for example, Roma, Roma and Sinti families whose children should be taken away. And this is what Yasmin Yildiz means. She, she uses different material than I use, but what she's trying to say is that the, the tactics and strategies about how we appear as racially marked people in this di these different media, including children's media, is not to address us, but to address white-centric uh, public and, and tell them about us so that, so that we then become the known monster, the inferiorized and demonized other. And one of the, the highest points of this was in, in, um, on the Sylvester, uh, on, on the change of the year between 2015 and 2016 in Cologne, when young men of color were demonized as, as uh, assaulting white women. And, and what a very racist term came up that said intensive criminals. The term is NAFRI in German, and it says North African intensive criminals. So that's, that's the link. The link is that we are not addressed, but, but the white centric public, public is addressed. Tell them about us so that they recognize us as demons, as monsters. Thank you, Dr. Olma. Professor Sumaru. So I hope I can be brief, but the, the question that was asked is a very, very important question in the French context, because we've mentioned, I think it was Ben, uh, the, we mentioned the moment of, you know, social turmoil and upheaval that comes hand in hand with the backlash. And the, in France, the backlash has come, let's say, from, you know, the traditional rights, from the far right, but the backlash is also coming from the left and from the, the white liberals. And the white liberals are the ones who are clinging to Marx and Marxism. So I don't have, and I don't think, I don't have a problem and I don't think there's a problem with Marx. What we need to understand, what everybody needs to accept is that Marxist um, analysis can be completed with, 
you know, people, intellectuals, activists, you know, scholars, you know, thinkers, writers, even people who have thought about race because race exists and needs to be taken into account. And some of those people, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, people of color, they have engaged Marx. They have, um, you know, incorporated sometimes Marxism. They have, um, they have uh, sometimes rejected Marx, Marxist analysis, right? So I don't think that Marx in himself is a problem. I think that elevating his analysis as the only way to conceptualize, to address, to understand the world and social dynamics is, is, is incredible. And I think that the, and unsustainable. And I think to have the luxury to rely on class analysis is also, it, it's a privilege that, 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 that only white people can benefit from. Like that in your experience as a you know, negatively racialized individual, you can, it cannot be, it can never be class only. There are wealthy people of color and their, their, their wealth will not protect them from racism, right? So just like people have uh, questioned and challenged, uh, I don't know, uh, Freud, for instance, in psycho psychoanalysis, feminists have, um, you know, um, added a, a feminist angle to Freud. So Freud is not the problem in himself, but Freud, just like Marx, have their limitation. And I think that what, what, what might constitute the, the avant-garde is really the most marginalized, the, 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 the thinking, the analysis produced in the margins, the, pe the, 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 the people who he inhabit, who embody all those intersections that we're talking about. And they have something to say. So it's not about choosing. There's room uh, for everyone. There are, there's room for all types of analysis, but it cannot be uh, one type of analysis to the exclusion of, of others. So we don't have to choose, but we have to share. We have to share. Marx is not a problem, but Marx is, is, is not a god. Marx is not all-knowing, mm -hmm. and there, there, <laughs> there needs to be more. That's all. <laughs> that, that, that's all. It's not a, it's not a rejection of Marx. We, we know. It's just that it's the narrative, the analysis is incomplete. It is incomplete. And this is what people need to understand. Thank you, Professor Sumaru. Dr. Talton. Uh, thank you both for those answers. That was really uh, very rich and illuminating. I'm just thinking about uh, the, the nature of the question. I don't want to come off as uh, nostalgic or romantic about the liberation movements of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I know they, they were flawed, but I think they were instructive in how people organized and, and, and brought the third world in the political sense of the third world. And I include African-Americans and Caribbean in the third world in, in the political ideological positionality sense of the word, of the term, not a developmentalist sense. One of the ways that there was this uh, coalition building and solidarity was uh, forms such as what we're having here that Professor Gomez has organized. So I, we're sitting in different parts of the world, but we're in conversation. And we're looking at points of intersection in our ideas, in our, in our movements. And there was, a, there was more of that, I believe. But it does, it's not to say that it doesn't happen today, but there was more of that in the past, but not just with scholars and intellectuals, but with artists, activists, and again, politicians as well, who would be brought into these conversations. And the only way that in this country, the Black Caucus in the 19, late 70s and 80s Black Caucus in Congress was so forceful on issues in the Caribbean and issues in Africa was because the intellectuals and activists and artists on the ground were pushing them to be that way. And so they had the freedom because their constituents held those positions. So they were free to have those positions. And they really came out of these communities. They reflected these constituencies. It's less so today. But I think more forums of this nature broadened to include a diversity of, of backgrounds from the diaspora, from Africa, I think would, would, would uh, fuel greater common cause and, solid, and solidarity. But I just, a final note though, um, on this point that I was making earlier about curricula. And I'm seeing here in New York City, there's this call for anti-racist curriculum. They're reevaluating their curricula to include books about black lives, issues about black lives opening students' minds and teachers' minds to white privilege and, and encouraging or, or fostering a sense of anti-racism. And I encourage that. But I think the difficulty is, is that becomes more self-help 
it's a corrective for your for who you are right it's like you recognize that you are racist and then become anti-racist and that's the solution for racism okay i think that's the first step but what that ignores is that racism is the system racism capitalism imperialism are racist global capitalism was founded and fueled on the lives of black bodies in the lands of native people. Now, when you bring that in, that's the backlash. So Nicole Hannah Jones and here in the States tried to do that with her 1619 project and you see the backlash. But that's the hard work we need to do in the education system. It's not about tweaking, it's a long-term project. And we need to have meetings like this to really restructure how we think about the relationship between race, imperialism, capitalism, and our modern systems today. And then we'll really understand systemic racism, but it's hard work. It's not about just reading Ralph Ellison, but read Ralph Ellison, but that's not gonna do it. <laughs> Professor Tarleton, thank you so much for your remarks and uh, what uh, our experience uh, for the last hour and 15, 16 minutes has demonstrated and, and, and revealed is uh, the, uh, the, uh, is that uh, we just don't have enough time. Uh, the, don't have enough time. Yeah. The, this discussion has been rich. It has been um, highly generative. I've learned a lot. Uh, we, you know, we, we're, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, clearly, we need the whole day uh, to sit down and just kind of go through uh, these issues. Uh, but we don't have that. But this is a this is a you know uh, this is an ongoing process, and hopefully we will uh, be able to uh, continue this conversation um, in short order and uh, move towards some sort of um, of resolution. Yeah, we don't want to just uh, you know revolve around uh, uh, conversation, but we want to actually get at uh, resolving these issues. And so I want to thank once again, uh, Professor Alma, Professor Sumaru, for Dr. Ben, uh, for your participation, uh, for your insights, for your reflections, just a marvelous, wonderful, you know, every time I'm, I'm in the company of, uh, of, of, of black intellectuals, African folk, I'm just, um, you know, it's just, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I wanna thank you. Uh, for your participation. I want to thank all of those who are, are, are with us virtually. Uh, we will, this session has, is being taped and will be made available very shortly on, um, uh, on the uh, Seaside website. So uh, thank every, I want to thank everyone once again. I hope everyone has a wonderful day, a wonderful evening, and, uh, and uh, we go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Gomez. Thank you, everyone. Always.